Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about USPAR, the anti-anxiety agent. Can it be used to treat ADHD? So the take-home message is that, yes, USPAR or buspirone is an anti-anxiety medication. That's the only FDA indication. So why are we talking about an anti-anxiety medication that primarily acts if you read anything about it, it's, we'll say it's a serotonin 1A receptor agonist. Why is that being talked about for ADHD? Well, for years, it's been on the lists of treatments that maybe is a third or fourth tier choice after the stimulants, after the other noradrenergic drugs like Wellbutrin or Statera, Atomoxetine, after Guantacine, after all those others, maybe you could try Buspar. But I would argue that there's Actually, it's not a huge body, but studies in humans and more data in rodents suggesting one, that Buspar can help directly with ADHD, and two, that it may be helpful for preventing some of the negative outcomes from stimulant medication so it could be used together. And there are neurochemical reasons why it's not bizarre to be thinking of this as a treatment for ADHD. What is Buspar? So Buspar chemically is called an as a parone, there's several drugs in this class. I believe Buspar was the first worldwide to be approved for any indication. It was approved in 1986, specifically for generalized anxiety disorder. That's the only indication in the U.S. for this drug. Some of the other as a parones are approved in other countries for depression. Some are approved for anxiety. Most of the summaries of what Buspirone does they describe it as a serotonin 1A partial agonist. So it binds to the receptor, the 1A receptor of serotonin, and it activates at that receptor, or at least partially activates. It turns out serotonin 1 receptors, 1A, are a complex group, and some of them are on the releasing side neurotransmitter, some are on the receiving side post synaptic end. And buspirone has a preference. Of Apparently, for the synaptic receptors. And by binding there, it reduces firing of the serotonin nerves. That's the initial effect. But then, over the course of several days to weeks, that winds up activating, boosting, upregulating your body, makes more serotonin 1A receptors, and it boosts the availability of serotonin and the release and firing of serotonin neurons, particularly in the amygdala and other limbic centers, not complete understanding and agreement of how that works, but that's our simplistic level understanding of how it's helping with depression and anxiety and other drugs that seem to upregulate serotonin 1A systems do seem to have antidepressant effects. So as I said, Buspar was approved in 1986. In 2001, it went generic. A few years after that, the company making it actually stopped making brand names. So all the Buspirone on the market right now in the U.S. is generic. And it was actually number 55 in the top meds used one of the more recent years. So it's actually a fairly popular medicine. Why it's fairly popular for anxiety is it's working on, again, primarily we think the serotonin system there. Unlike almost all our other anti-anxiety agents, which are working on the GABA system. So our benzodiazepines, the Valium, Ativan, Xanax drugs, alcohol, barbiturates, epipentin, all are working on the GABA system. All of those seem to have some potential for addiction and tend to be sedating to different extents, whereas buspirone is considered to be free of any addiction potential and relatively not sedating. So it's not completely free of side effects, although I can say clinically in the range of 5 to 60 milligrams and usually or 15 to 60 milligrams. The vast majority of people I have worked with who've tried use brown and stayed with it have literally no effects. They can't even tell whether they took it a given day or not. Some people do have a little, I describe it as cloudiness. Some can cause tinnitus ringing in the ears. It can cause nausea. I've never seen that. A little bit of sort of dizziness, spaciness is the only, actually that's the only thing I've seen over the years with it. And because buspirone has a short half-life on the order of just a few hours, it's commonly recommended as 
twice a day or three times a day dosing, which is inconvenient for anybody, but can be a particular deal breaker for many people with ADHD. Part of that, again, is because it's very rapidly metabolized and broken down into other active metabolites that are far more prevalent and far more active than the buspirone itself. So one is that for drugs that are working slowly and indirect, indirectly causing receptor reproliferation or changes that take place over days at a time, we don't seem to need constant bombardment of those receptors. It needs to be a long enough signal, a clear enough signal, a robust enough signal, but you don't need, like when you're using an antibiotic, you want steady state drug levels or an anti-seizure medicine. You want coverage all the time because the action of the drugs is direct and you need it to be hitting those receptors or blocking whatever it's doing. With drugs that are working indirectly that are causing activation of receptors or upregulation, downregulation of receptors, those you can usually get away with less than steady state, absolutely constant blood level. So with antidepressants, then the vaccine effects or has very short half-life, was initially recommended as a multiple times a day drug and then made as a slow release form. We know that just once a day of the immediate release form works as well as full doses a day. When we're talking about buspirone, we're actually not even talking about buspirone. So circulating in your body, if you're taking buspirone, about less than two or 3% of the active buspirone like action, including action on the serotonin 1A receptor system, is coming from buspirone. So some of the other metabolites, one of them is called 1,2-pyrimidinolpipirazine, 1PP for short. That's a strong alpha-2 antagonist, alpha-2 being referred to the noradrenergic system. So buspirone itself has some strong alpha-2 agonist property, but there's much more 1PP, probably five to 20 times as much as there is buspar floating in your body. Alpha-2 agents that we have, one is Remeron near Tazabine, which is a good antidepressant and helps with anxiety. Another is Yohimbine, but strong alpha-2 antagonism seems to boost norepinephrine and dopamine as well as serotonin. And that's one plausible mechanism by which buspar itself, but also primarily through 1PP, may be having a direct beneficial effect for ADHD, which you boost norepinephrine and dopamine, that seems to have direct effects. One of the other major metabolites of buspirone is 6-hydroxybuspirone. There's 40 times more 6-hydroxybuspirone in someone's body than there is buspirone. And 6-hydroxybuspirone is itself a good serotonin 1A agonist. So when we're talking about what buspirone does, we're probably primarily talking about what its breakdown products, its metabolites do, rather than the buspar itself. Third major way that buspirone may have relevance to ADHD is what it was actually researched for to begin with. They were designing it, they're hoping it would be a good antipsychotic because it is a dopamine blocking agent at dopamine 2 receptors, which is where certainly in the old days, most of our or all of our old antipsychotics worked. You would think, well, that would be opposite what we want for an ADD agent where we're usually boosting dopamine. But it turns out that buspirone is actually better at blocking dopamine 3 and 4 receptors than it is at one or dopamine 1 or 2 receptors. And again, all of these chemical systems are complex feedback loops upregulating. So at least at low levels of buspirone, probably through D3 or D4 blockage, that's actually causing some increase output through dopaminergic systems and particularly in the nucleus accumbens, which are involved in reward, motivation, activation centers that seem implicate in ADHD. A few other clinical issues, the, the P450 liver enzyme system that's breaking down buspirone into these meta is the 3A4 system. Fortunately, that's one that not a huge number of other drugs interfere with. So a few antifungals, a few other antibiotics do mess. Hegretol, trying to remember one or two other drugs. Luvox interferes with 3A4, but grape juice is another one. So if you drink too much grape juice, you will inhibit P450 and you may 
wind up with more abuse bar and less six hydroxy abuse barone and less one PP in your body. So take it easy on the grapefruit if you're taking abuse bar. Separate from our neurochemical understanding. So some people have said eusperins are a good agent for generalized anxiety. There's a lot of overlap with anxiety and ADHD. Maybe all we're doing when we give it to people with ADHD is blocking the component of anxiety or helping with anxiety. That may be helpful for some people. But again, we do have these additional biochemical modes of action and careful assessment for anxiety. It does seem to be directly helping with ADHD. So a few other things. again. Eusperone's approved uses anxiety and specifically generalized anxiety. It's used off-label. Maybe half of it is actually adding onto an existing antidepressant to augment that to make it work better. Again, many of our antidepressants seem to have an eventual common mode of action of upregulating that serotonin 1A receptor system. Eusper research and clinically has been shown to do, although I haven't seen it benefit that many patients in this regard. But when people are having sexual side effects from SSRIs, adding abuse bar, at least statistically, is likely to lead to improvement in sexual side effects. Many anti-anxiety agents are good for helping get through withdrawal effects from other agents. So if you're having alcohol withdrawals, actually usually benzodiazepines like clonopin are given clinically to prevent seizures and other problems. Or if you're withdrawing from a short-acting benzo like Xanax, you may be put on clonopin or another long-acting agent. But of note, even though the abuse bar is a good anti-anxiety agent, it's again not having any effects on the GABA system. So it's not been shown to have any great use in reducing withdrawal symptoms from other anti-anxiety agents, again, which are chemically different class. So jumping into the abuse bar for ADHD. There are a number of studies, starting with some case reports, starting with some open trials where they just recruited 10, 12 people that showed very significant benefits of use bar in people with ADHD, including inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, disruptive behavior, anger outbursts. Benefits seem to arise over the course of several weeks. Many of them were designed to check if the result was faster. And in many of these studies, return of ADD symptoms happened within days to weeks after stopping the buspirone. Now, one thing, most of these studies were fairly small. Again, the most strongly positive ones tended to be open studies, but there were some placebo-controlled studies. And the other thing is almost all the clinical work on buspar for ADHD is 20 to 30 years old. And unfortunately, it's still the case that most of the research on neurochemical benefits is coming from the drug companies who want to market for a certain condition. When it went generic, the incentive went out the window. There have been a couple studies doing head-to-head comparisons with Ritalin. A few studies showed comparable effects to Ritalin for treating ADHD. More studies seem to show benefit for treating ADHD, but not as strong a benefit as Ritalin. And a few showed couldn't find a statistically significant benefit for use for own, even though some of those, the results seem to be leaning that it was doing something. Most of those were in kids, as most of our ADHD research is, but there's one at least looking at use for own in combination with adamoxetine stratera that was done in adults. That one, there was a suggestion that adding use bar to stratera had some added benefit, but most of the endpoints were not statistically significant there. So in addition though, to the human clinical data, which again, it's certainly more substantial than we have for ketamine treating ADHD or for marijuana treating ADHD, there's a number of studies on rats. And in rats and in humans, one of the consequences of long-term stimulant use, particularly looking at Ritalin, methylphenidate, is that there is down-regulation of the serotonin 1A system. And experimentally, in rodents, a number of different studies have shown that giving buce bar while you're giving Ritalin, because again, the buce bar upmodulates, upregulates the serotonin 1A systems. Many, at least in rodents, probably more of the downsides of Ritalin seem to be attributable to this 
long-term down regulation of serotonin 1A. So there are studies showing, this is one that's actually in humans and I don't know if there's any in rats, but teeth grinding called bruxism, which is a uncommon but not rare side effect with stimulants that Buspar can stop that. Liver toxicity has been seen with Ritalin in humans, but it's more common with rodents. That liver toxicity can be blocked by co-administration with Buspar. Growth inhibition, but in rodent models of that, the growth inhibition seems to be prevented by co-administration with Buspar. Some both behavioral and neurochemical markers for propensity or potential for substance abuse seem to be diminished or rectified, corrected when you co-administer abuse for own. So the right dose, usually at the lower end of the spectrum, helps with cognition, but too high a dose, too long a time with stimulants leads to some measures of cognitive dulling. And again, that effect as well seems to be blocked by buspirone. So Jepirone is another azapirone. It's in the same class as buspirone. Also gets broken down into 1PP. So it's very similar to buspar. The company that makes it first applied for approval for depression to the FDA in 2002. Some of you weren't even born that and kept reapplying, reapplying. They submitted 15 different studies before the FDA deemed two of those studies. And that's all the FDA requires is two positive studies. Doesn't care how many negative or inconclusive studies there were. So Jepirone was finally approved. It's under the brand name Exua. I can't find any price data or anywhere else online. So I'm not even sure if it's in the stores. Supposedly it is. That may generate more interest in using this class of agents for depression or anxiety, but for ADHD as well. Stay healthy, stay happy. I hope you're not too cold wherever you are. 